Hello and welcome back to Next Generation Central Banking. Uh, my name is Michael and I'm happy to introduce the last part uh, of our conference. Um, we will have a keynote by Zivi Gula and a panel debate uh, followed. And um, yeah, to kick things off, I will just introduce our um, wonderful facilitator uh, tonight, um, Frank van Leven. He is Senior Economist at New Economics Foundation in the UK and is leading NEF's work on greening central banks and monetary policy but has also been starting to focus on uh, fiscal policy in uh, a lot more as of late. Okay, hi, Frank. Hi there, Michael. And I'll um, just kind of jump back out and uh, cede the floor to you and uh, the discussion for tonight. Great. First of all, look, thank you so much for inviting me to chair at this amazing event. I think everybody um, in our communities and circles is just really wowed by all the effort um, that you guys have put in and, and really amplified some key messages. And before I, I introduce what I'm guaranteeing will be a spicy, excellent, probably the best panel of, of the entire week today, I just wanted to, to make some opening remarks. And I, I think it was, it's really important to start off with the idea that we are, we are effectively in the midst of the greatest um, health, social and economic shock of our lifetimes and the reason why this conference is so timely is because the policy agenda set in the emergency and recovery phase that we now face in this year ahead will have profound socioeconomic effects determining the shape of our economy long after this 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 pandemic is over and to this effect i wanted to quote one of my favorite monetary economists of, of this generation uh, professor perry merling and it's not liquidity kills you quick because that's one of his best ones. But what he says, what he said is, the underlying challenge is that the future toward which we are building before the coronavirus is not the future towards which we will be building after the coronavirus. Businesses and business models that were great before the crisis may not be so great after the crisis. And businesses and business models that did not even exist before the crisis may be great after the crisis. The interesting thing about this quote and what this conference has shown is that the same thing can be said about central banking models and their relationship with fiscal models. As we look to recover from, from the devastation left in the wake of the pandemic, no matter where you sit on the spectrum, new forms of fiscal and monetary coordination are being created and need to be created, especially because we cannot afford to leap out of the COVID frying pan into the climate fire. A socially just uh, recovery and a climate emergency effectively poses a number of unprecedented financial risks to our economy, and these are laced with significant radical uncertainty. So I'm honored to chair this panel to discuss some of these themes today, um, to talk about new forms of fiscal monetary and coordination and central banking and climate change. And to kick us off to this great event or this, this panel, we have um, Sylvie Goulard, I hope I've said that right, who is the second deputy governor of the Banque de France since January 2018. Before that, she was a member of the European Parliament between 2009 and 2017, where she was a member of the Committee for um, Economic and Monetary Affairs. Welcome, Sylvie. Thank you very much, Frank. Zuerst ein Wort auf Deutsch. Vielen, vielen Dank äh, für die Einladung. Äh, es ist komisch für die Heinrich Böll Stiftung auf Englisch zu sprechen, aber ich werde es versuchen. Uh, thank you. So I will try to be not too long, but to give you a comprehensive framework. So the first slide, please. Michael? Yes. Uh, well, on, on the assessment, uh, I believe that the people who are in this panel all agree. Uh, climate change is real, it's severe, it's irreversible. Here you have the different pathways if we act or if we don't act. So the cost of no action is huge and it is not thinkable that we don't act. Once again, I belong to the people convinced and there are many in the central bank communities. You have to remember that sometimes it happens when you go outside this kind of uh, group of people that some people even deny uh, the gravity of the situation. I'm just saying this not to say it's a pretext not to act, but sometimes I'm really, I'm really puzzled. Second slide, please. So 
first of all, and I say it not only because we are, we are in Germany tonight, but I really believe that the question of uh, democracy is an important one. Uh, the, primar the primary responsibility to act relies by uh, elected policy makers. Uh, they are the ones who are supposed to take policy actions. First of all, because regulation and fiscal tools are more legitimate and, and efficient. Uh, and they do, and they do. Uh, and we see the commitments to carbon neutrality in law or in proposed legislation in several parts of the world. We have quoted the EU, UK, China. We could also add uh, France and, and some other countries uh, globally. The second reason is that they are entitled to reflect what the people want. And, um, and it's very important for an independent body like a central bank to stick to its mandate. It's a matter of respect for democracy. Nevertheless, central banks and supervisors can act and must exercise all their responsibility within the framework of their mandates. As Christine Lagarde said, I like very much the, the sentence, it's everybody's responsibility. No one can wash uh, his or her hands. And as I said before, the cost of inaction uh, is, is huge. The more we wait, the more costly and abrupt the transition will be. So we have no time to lose. Next slide, please. Um, when Mark Carney made his uh, famous speech in September 2015, uh, the central bank world was not always aware of the risks. He helped us to uh, frame the discussion between the physical transition and liability risk. I'm not going back to that. Uh, so you have to see that uh, it's a long journey for central bank and we have been doing it for more uh, more than five years now and we are uh, very numerous now to be convinced that within the mandate we can do uh, a lot uh, first of all to ensure that the financial system is resilient to this risk so the first approach was a risk-based one and um, in december 2017 we created the the ngfs the network for greening the financial system that is of course uh, is raison d'être, it's raison d'être is really the, 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 the financial stability, but we try to act on supervision, on non-monetary portfolio, on monetary policy, and I will show it later. And as Christine Lagarde uh, always stressed, we, without changing the mandate, we can do a lot in the way we forecast, we measure risk, we stress test institutions, we value collateral, et cetera. So my first message is we are in, uh, in this going, ongoing process, and we try to do our best to cover all the fields. But of course, there is a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. And um, of course, it's it's always for climate. It's always uh, too little, as 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 the challenge is huge. But I want to uh, to show you that within a little bit more than three years, uh, when the the NGFS was created, it was in December. Uh, 2017, when President Macron launched the One Planet Summit, we were only eight central banks, including the Banque de France, the Bundesbank, but also the Moroccan uh, Bank, Mexico, Singapore, China, so it was already global. Uh, we in the Banque de France provide the secretariat. Within three years, we are 83 members, including the Fed since uh, December, and 13 observers from all of us from the five continents, which gives us these fantastic vision of all aspects of climate change, developed country, but also less developed countries, emerging economies, countries that are going to be hit directly because they are islands or uh, threatened by desertification, etc. Of course, it's only a coalition of willing. It's not a standard setting body. We don't have enforcement powers. But we did our best, and now with the Fed on board, all together, we supervise all global systemically important banks and two thirds of the global systemically important insurers. And we cover more or less, once again, we have to be very modest because it's the indirect action potentially uh, uh, could cover 75% of global greenhouse emissions. Please, next slide. So I don't want to insist that climate related risks uh, are a source of financial risk. I wanted to say that last year in January, we published the Banque de France and the BIS 
uh, our team and, and Luis Pereira, you all know, uh, a small book called The Green Swan, trying to make the difference between the famous black swan of Nicolas Taleb uh, in the financial world and something that could be more related with um, climate. Uh, and this book shows that, that it is an existential risk, existential risk, sorry, um, the irreversibility makes it impossible to cope with it individually. Cooperation is vital. Nobody can be uh, hedged against this kind of risk. It's a non-linear, very complex phenomenon and the occurrence is certain. We don't know when, but it could happen. I just mentioned this because they have also done, they, they are doing the team from the bank and some others in the secretariat of the NGFS with correspondence everywhere, a huge work and after the, the COVID crisis, we realized that it was even something, um, uh, how can I say, relevant for pandemic. So I just wanted to make a small publicity, but you don't mind because it's a green object. So the green swan you have on our website. Now, what are we doing at the French level? Uh, this is the first field. And of course, next slide, please. Uh, there is a first aspect we do in France and where we try to do to, to work together in the NGFS, it's the supervision. Uh, how can we have influence on, on, the, on the financial sector and the, the body that in France is independent but linked to the Banque de France uh, in charge of supervision uh, is, or is doing right now a pilot uh, stress tax exercise. They are voluntary, but many bank and insurance company thought the COVID crisis maintained their participation. We try to assess the exposure. We try to assist the industry. We will publish the results in April. Because of course, if you want to do many other things, such as uh, green TLTROs or green indirect uh, monetary policy, you need to be sure that the banks and the financial sector are involved in themselves in pricing properly the risk. And the, 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 the work done by the Banque de France is based on a guide, a handbook uh, made by the NGFS on climate scenario analysis for central banks and supervisors. Uh, I just specify for, for the people listening that all the work of the NGFS is available on the website. You can download it, it's free. And you will see that this global work helps us to exchange views and to step-by-step step build the tools we did not have. Next, next uh, step, please. There are some fundamental questions. I'm not just going to give uh, questions, but I think we have to admit that we don't know all the answers. We have to be very humble in front of phenomena that are quite complicated here. I've put as an example, the question of double materiality. Do you just look at your contribution to physical and transition risks, or do you include your own vulnerability to physical and transition risks? How do you make sure that you have this double approach in which you really identify um, if a corporate or financial institution is coping properly with climate change? So there are many questions. What are the goals? Do we want to protect our balance sheet? Do we want to mitigate the risks for the whole system, contribute to the transition? I know that some people write it is easy to do all this. Once again, we are committed. It's not at all an excuse not to act, but some questions are quite tricky. Next slide, please. There are practical challenges. I've just list, uh, listed some of them. Um, uh, for example, I take just an example. Do you go green or do you exclude uh, carbon operation? How do you feel the data gap? A very important point. We need uh, data, we need serious metrics, we need to be, uh, to agree on the methodology and each time you can agree worldwide, it's better to do it by yourself. So do we need dynamic indicators, static indicators where you take a forward looking scenario approach or do you just look at the data you had for the past? Climate is tricky because in the past it was often the case in finance, you look at the data from the past and you try to, to uh, determine what is going to happen. But of course, uh, with a complex uh, phenomenon, when you have non-linear risk, it's quite complicated. Do we, have, uh, do we want to cover all asset classes, corporate banks, 
securitized product sovereign with some issues for sovereign from a political point of view. I'm not uh, and we're going to enter uh, in this, but you perfectly know, uh, supra non-marketable assets. Who are the reliable data providers? Uh, can you be sure that they will provide data in a way that you can have series or and you can compare? Next slide, please. I'm, I'm running a little bit. Just to mention, uh, we have been doing a, an exercise on responsible investment policy since 2018. It's excellent to put your money where the mouth is because then you discover, I'm chairing the risk committee of the Banque de France. I can tell you that even if you do it with a strong commitment, then when you have to take the decisions, what, what are we, we buying? Uh, do we make scopes one, scope two? The Banque de France, I take two examples. We decided to participate in, uh, in assemblies and to vote, which was not an easy issue for a central bank. And we uh, decided recently a definitive exit from coal in 2024. And I'm proud to say that yesterday, the governing council of the ECB, and the first part was on France, and this, this is on, on the euro system, agreed on a common position for non-monetary policy portfolio for the whole euro system. And it will help us to go together. So the Banque de France, with some others, of course, uh, they are very dynamic partners in the euro system, but we are the ones driving a little bit with the others and some others would like to do it and they will benefit also from uh, what we have already tried to do, once again, being modest. Then two, so this was the second block after the third block, after financial stability, after um, supervision, greening of the non-monetary policy portfolios. And then I move to the last point, which is, uh, quite important, the one of monetary policy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we all know that if you look at it from a global point of view, central banks operates with legally defined mandates, sometimes broader, sometimes narrower. For the ECB, it's focused on price stability. But in the NGFS, we made a survey with uh, 51 countries responding. And you see that quite nowhere you have climate change as, as, as a target, but it does not mean that many, that, well, on the country, most ECB consider that there is room to, to, to take climate risk into account. So the question of market neutrality does not mean the status quo. You know that uh, Isabel Schnabel made a, a very interesting speech in, in September last year, in which she underlined the failure of the market in, uh, and the need for collective action to, to tackle climate change, even if until now the markets because the economy is carbonized, we're not pricing the risk properly. And what we try to do is not to look at it from the legal perspective. There are controversies. The, the treaty only says that uh, we have to work along the line of, uh, along the principle of an open market economy. Uh, we go to the operational side. And when you go to the operational side, then you realize that there are already restrictions or choices made by, by the central bank. And then you see what you would like to do. And this is the next slide. We are in, the, in a strategic review at the ECB. It was launched by Christine Lagarde when she, when she um, joined the ECB. Because of the pandemic, it was a little bit delayed. We are in the phase of the ongoing technical work. The decision of the governing council is to come. So I have no big decision to announce. It's not my purpose today. I just wanted to to see with you that there are uh, ranges of possible action. Uh, how do we uh, look at disclosure? Do we have the disclosure? Uh, is the TFCFD going to be the benchmark? Are we going to have European rules? Should the European rules come from uh, the legislator? Has the ECB something to do? But the disclosure, once again, I come to the data I've stressed before, you need to have the data, you have to ha need you to have the information to be sure that you can act properly and in a fair way, if I may, a footnote on market neutrality, of course, as a public authority, we have to treat in a fair way two different companies or issuing bonds with the same profile. We have to be very careful that it is fair, but which does not mean that we don't make so, some differences. So you have also the question of collateral, uh, the question of asset purchases. Do you exclude some uh, bonds? Do you go green? Do you 
play with tilted purchases. And here, our experience from the own uh, portfolio can be um, very useful because we are already playing with how do you exclude some coal? How do you take into account gas as a transition energy, like the taxonomy of the European Commission says, et cetera, et cetera. You also have the, the credit operation, the refinancing operation. I've forgotten to put them here. So all in all, uh, I'm sure that um, all the ongoing reflection is going to produce something. The NGFS is doing the same analysis work-wide on the links between climate change and monetary policy. It's very interesting for us because as there are few examples worldwide, we try to look at what People's Bank of China has done, the Reichsbank has done also uh, some negative screening. You also have sometimes um, central banks from emerging economy, Bangladesh or Indonesia, uh, providing very interesting, um, uh, well, I have to stop. I know I move to the two last slides. I just two words, if I may. Um, it's a global issue. You require a global perspective. The more we can have a harmonized and compulsory set of metric standards, uh, disclosure rules, the better. We need a common understanding and here the taxonomy of the European Commission, I, I want really to pay tribute to what they have done, the International Platform of Sustainable Finance. 2021 is a fantastic year because of the COP26, the Italian presidency with the planet as one of the three priorities and the EU administration in the US. And now the very last slide, I just wanted to say a word on something. A huge work has been doing for uh, for years on climate. It's not enough, maybe for some of you. It's we need to continue. But there are new new uh, issues such as biodiversity. Biodiversity loss could be a financial risk. The Dutch uh, central bank did a fantastic report indebted to nature, and there are also questions on health. I belong to a commission of the WHO Europe rethinking policy priorities in the light of pandemics, where we try to see, we have not yet produced a report, if all the work done for climate could be used for other topics. I'm sorry if I was too long, but I'm passionate. So I hope you can forgive me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sylvie. That was absolutely um, a very stimulating um, presentation. And I think there's gonna be lots of subjects there for us to touch on later. Um, now I'd like to introduce our other two panelists. Um, we have Professor Daniela Gabor, who is Professor of Economics and Macro Finance at the University of West England in Bristol, and has published widely on central banks and the financial system. Um, she's one of my personal heroes. She has published a new paper specifically for this con conference on monetary finance called Revolution Without, Revolution Without Revolutionaries. Welcome, Daniela. And we also have Sabine. I really cannot pronounce your last name. I'm so sorry. Sabine Lotta Schlager um, was a member of the ECB's executive board from 2014 to 2019 before she laid down her mandate, which I'm sure she'll tell us uh, a bit more about later. Previously, she worked for the German government, specifically in banking supervision. Um, welcome, Sabine, and what a pleasure it is to have to speak to you all. Um, Daniela, you were going to kick us off. Yes, thank you, Frank. Uh, if I may share my screen. Let's see. Yeah, can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, uh, so um, I look forward to, to this uh, very interesting panel. I am the other uh, non-German speaker on the panel. So um, uh, with that in mind, uh, let me still uh, bring the debate a little bit um, home by, by noticing and framing it uh, following the excellent uh, uh, presentation we just heard. Uh, I want to, to sort of start by saying that if the European Central Bank has a, a strategy review for monetary policy, there are two arms there that uh, are quite important. One that has to do with the climate crisis and how central banks must uh, can adjust to that. And the other one is the interactions or interlinkages between monetary and fiscal policy. And what I want to do in the seven minutes, we agreed that we'll, be, we'll keep it short so we can uh, disagree for the rest of the hour. Uh, uh, what I want to argue is that we cannot discuss the role of uh, central banks in tackling climate uh, change and, and the climate crisis without uh, discussing uh, 
the uh, emerging fiscal monetary inter uh, interlinkages and interactions and bringing them together in a more coherent framework than we have at the moment. And I wanted to start uh, my interventions by showing you this very famous quote from uh, Marvin King, who used to be the governor of the Bank of England, and who argued that central banks are often accused of being obsessed with inflation. This is untrue. If they are obsessed with anything, it is with fiscal policy. And I'm curious what the other two central bankers on this panel think about this quote. But uh, if you want to have a context for this idea that it is not inflation in the first place, but fiscal policy that really bears heavily on the mind of central bankers, I want to show you this graph from um, the report for, the, for this conference that I've written called Revolution Without Revolutionaries. Uh, and uh, this graph tells us a little bit uh, in, in a, what, what I think is a stark picture of why central banks have been and what does it mean to be obsessed with fiscal policy. And if you look at the period in between the late 1970s or the early 1980s up to the global financial crisis, what we see is a very clear institutional separation between the central bank and governments in the sense that uh, the share of central bank holdings of public debt or of government debt declines very rapidly after the 1970s, after the age of what we call the Keynesian age of uh, macroeconomic management, and it stays very close to zero in the large uh, countries of the Eurozone. There are lots of other uh, countries that are not included here, but France, Germany, Italy are quite important. And what we see after 2008, and this is not something that is specific to the pandemic, although uh, everybody's more aware now that central banks have been buying government debt uh, right, left, and center. But what we see after 2008 is that central banks have come back to government bond markets on quite significant levels. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why the monetary fiscal interlinkages are part of the strat strategy review of the ECB. But uh, there is a, a bigger question that is at stake here and that we will be debating. Is this the end of central bank independence as we know it? Should we worry that this signals something quite uh, dangerous? And we heard from an earlier speaker uh, who used to be the deputy governor of the Hungarian central bank, that this is a very slippery slope if uh, central banks somehow become captured by politicians again. And in the report that, that I have done, I argue that we should not confuse the age of Keynesian uh, fiscal dominance, as we, we call it in macroeconomics, the age when central banks were subordinated to uh, governments. And what does this subordination mean? Uh, for, I think, much briefer uh, periods of time than we, we typically acknowledge, central banks under a Keynesian fiscal dominance regime, they used to intervene in government bond markets and keep their borrowing costs under control. So uh, as to allow governments to do aggregate de demand management and on the longer uh, term to do industrial policy or allocation of credit in one way or another. Where we are now since 2008, it's not the same scenario at all, I would argue. If we take into account the broader macroeconomic regime, the broader institutional uh, hierarchy, we live in what I call a revolution without revolutionaries in the sense that BlackRock, for example, can argue that we need a revolution in central banking. We need central banks to be closer to governments and they become closer, but nobody wants to assume this uh, relationship uh, very closely. It's like a, an affair that nobody wants to really uh, uh, sort of be public uh, with. And what I argue in the paper is that this is a necessary uh, uh, realignment of central banks with fiscal authorities because we live in a new macro financial order. So if we start from how financial markets work today, how modern finance operates, then uh, the state that through fiscal policy has become a collateral factory for banking and shadow banking in, in the Euro area. And this is not, these are not my words, these are the words of Alberto Giovannini, who is famous in European technocratic circles as being the architect of the European macro financial order. And what that, what that means for central banks, and this is not just the European Central Bank or Bank of England, the, the US Federal Reserve, is that central banks are forced, they view themselves as necessary closer to governments because that's the way to manage the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So in a sense, the idea of central bank independence that we have is not, it doesn't sit very well with how modern finance operates and what it requires central banks to do in order to provide financial stability. And there is a debate about market maker of last resort. I don't want to bore you with, but we can come back to it. And they also talk about a macro driven signaling channel. If you want the private sector to be able to lend at, at lower costs, as you do in a crisis, then you have to bring government uh, borrowing costs under control. 
Now, I'll finish with this. Why is this a state of affair, uh, affairs, to my mind, uh, not enough? Or uh, can, why, does, why can it raise political problems for the future? And I'm quoting here a, a couple of, I think, very powerful ways of thinking about this that come from a book written by Simon Mee on a, a entitled Central Bank Independence and the Legacy of the German Past, where he looks at the debates around the independence of uh, the Bundesbank in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, there was a debate then about uh, the extent to which we want central banks to be a state within the state. Right? And looking back at the uh, German history uh, before the Second World War, the idea is that if you allow the central bank to be a state within the state, in other words, if you allow it to solely concentrate on inflation, then you run the risks that uh, it might sacrifice employment during uh, bad times in order to keep up with the policy of, of sound money. And uh, why is this problematic now? Because in the new macrofinancial order that we have, that I just discussed, I think we have a fiction of central bank independence to some extent that basically covers for more power for central banks in, in terms of setting the terms of their interventions in government bond markets. When Lagarde, uh, Christine Lagarde, the governor of the ECB, uh, accepted publicly that the ECB was more or less there to close the spreads because there was a lot of uh, pressure from financial markets to do so, she wasn't forced to specify what does it mean to close spreads or what is the, 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 the actual spread that is reasonable to have uh, in uh, government bond markets issued by member states of the euro area. And that is a problem because we are now at very high public debt to GDP ratios. And there is a threat that we will see in Europe what we have seen with Bank of England after 2010. In other words, we will continue with this regime of shadow monetary financing, which is central banks will continue to be significant actors in government bond markets, but this will go hand in hand with fiscal austerity. This is what we had in, in the UK after 2010, and it came with significant costs to the uh, UK economy, with significant costs to uh, social cohesion, to poverty. There is a long list of problems that this created. And I think the more significant costs have to do with where we are looking next for the green transition, for the transition to the low carbon economy. Uh, there is a lot the central banks have done so far, and uh, Sylvie Goulart may, uh, told you a, a, a very good story about it. But I worry that we will look at some point at sacrificing uh, the climate crisis or the fight against the climate crisis in order to preserve central bank independence or in order to preserve this idea of uh, uh, sound money. And if we are to recognize, as central banks have done, that government bond markets are so important in the monetary transmission mechanism, then we need politically to come to a better mechanism that specifies how central banks and governments should work together in order to, to finance large scale green public investment. And that can include the, the uh, possibility of yield targeting. I also want to mention that if that this is not, should not be solely the, the job of central banks, but we need also uh, fiscal authorities in the Eurozone and elsewhere to assume publicly the uh, responsibility for the idea that fiscal rules should be abandoned, particularly in the Eurozone. Uh, Olivier Blanchard and several others have made a, a really interesting proposal about replacing fiscal rules with fiscal standards so that the fiscal authorities assume more um, overtly and publicly what the chief economist of the um, OECD, Lawrence Boone, called for a, a return to some form of uh, Keynesian aggregate demand management during times of crisis when the uh, government is in the driving seat during bad, bad times. And uh, if Sylvie Goulart is right about how pressing the climate crisis is, then governments will need to be in the driving seat to fight the climate crisis, but they cannot do it without central banks closely coordinating with them. And I'll stop here. Wonderful. Thanks, Daniela. Um, Sabine, did you want to make your comments? Well, many thanks. And first of all, let me thank Finanzwende as well as Heinrich Böll Stiftung for the invitation to this great conference. It was really uh, a great pleasure to listen, you know, to all the other panels um, uh, the last two days and to participate in this very important discussion about what is the central bank role uh, with regard to these today's biggest challenges. Yeah? And the challenges are immense. I think we all agree. Yeah? And we are talking now about climate change, but we could talk about poverty and inequality. We could talk about health like Sylvie. Um, said, um, we could talk about uh, uh, biodiversity. Yeah? So there are many challenges. And so it's no wonder yeah, that many turn to the central banks, requiring them 
um, uh, to join forces with the government and the idea of monetary financing has found again many supporters, um, in particular, as Daniela said, yeah, um, as sovereign debt and deficits are rising. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, you will not be surprised and, and Daniela and, and, and myself, we are really waiting for having a hot debate yeah, that I do not recommend, yeah, that I rather recommend caution with regard to um, uh, the request uh, um, of monetary financing as a means to tackle the challenges ahead. And let me be very clear, I'm not saying that central banks do not have a role uh, with regard to climate change. Uh, and Sylvie very eloquently put all the topics yeah, um, on the table where we can do something. Um, but what we should not do is monetary financing, nor should we just um, um, shed our independence. Yeah? And why not? Because I think we will shoot ourselves in our own feet by relaunching monetary financing and by coordinating fiscal and monetary policies as so many wish uh, a, a very close coordination. Um, I think that um, to battle climate change, um, it will be, a, we need to think long-term, yeah? It will be, a, it will not be a sprint, it will be a marathon. And um, we should be very wary um, of the medium and long-term effects of such a change in the direction of monetary policy and in the institutional setup of the ECB um, when talking about this marathon. Yeah? Um, we might have short-term advantages, um, establishing quickly, for example, um, a, a kind of temporary financing for the huge cost of the transition path we will have uh, for the European uh, economy. But, um, and with this, we would, for sure win a battle, but we risk losing the war, as I would say, because um, we risk losing the central bank's capacity uh, to act, um, um, to ensure price stability. And price stability and financial stability are requirements for being successful in financing these huge costs of transition uh, on the long run, and that we should not forget. Yeah. So let me just ask some question in order to explain why I'm so concerned about the um, discussion um, of, of monetary financing um, and, and coordination um, with the ECB um, and, and, and uh, politicians um, in order to move um, coordinated in one direction. Yeah. First is, is there a free lunch when a central bank is financing the government? It seems to be, yeah? I mean, when I heard the last three days discussion, there was not a lot of um, arguments about what would happen yeah, when the ECB would do monetary financing, but there is a price to pay. And the highest price of it all is the loss of credibility of the central bank, the loss of confidence, um, of the market and uh, the public in the capacity of the ECB to act and as a consequence is spiraling inflation. Do we expect monetary financing for the benefit of combating the climate change to continue when inflation overshoots the ECB targets? And when inflation needs to be contained, will the central bank be still able to exit monetary policy measures in form of monetary financing and to withdraw liquidity from the market without risking financial stability and um, a debt sustainability um, of the countries. I doubt that. Yeah? I mean, we, we do have several events in um, the past which has shown us how difficult it is for a central bank to use its instrument and contain inflation when monetary policy is hindered by fiscal dominance. Yeah? And, uh, when there is fiscal dominance, the central bank is in a precarious situation in an inflationary environment as the withdrawal of the expensive um, monetary policy measures um, is likely to endanger debt sustainability of the country, of the, of the union and financial stability and therefore the transmission channel for monetary policy would be disturbed. Yeah. Who is going to decide what is going to be financed by the ECB? I mean, the ECB does not have the mandate and is not dem democratically legitimized, talking about respect with regard to democracy, like Sylvie said, uh, to make any political decision which of the many challenges, health, 
biodiversity, climate change, inequality, etc., is going to be addressed via monetary finance. Um, to oblige the ECB to coordinate its monetary financing with elected politicians leaves the ECB open to all kinds of political influence. I, I thought that my um, Hungarian uh, colleague yeah, was very vocal, uh, very passionate about what can happen. Yeah? So um, if you do lose the independence in one area, this is a trigger and there's no way going back. Would it be legally possible to do monetary financing? For sure not. I will not bore you with the legal analysis. Also, I'm a lawyer and that is the easiest thing for me to do, yeah? I mean, the, the treaty is very clear on that. It's very clear with regard to independence, yeah? It's very clear with regard to monetary financing. The institutional setup is directly linked, yeah? To the prohibition of monetary financing. So there was a clear intention of the lawmaker. And I mean, as a lawyer, I have to tell you, I shy away, yeah, of, um, thinking about just violating yeah, such um, very clear intentions. So there would need to be um, a change in the treaty. Yeah? Um, a change in the treaty. <laughs> I mean, that is a difficult question. I, I would not wish uh, for that. And let me perhaps for one minute add something um, to the shadow monetary financing Daniela talked about. And in many things we agree, by the way, uh, Daniela, yeah. Um, what we do not agree uh, with is, I believe, I'm convinced that the QE, that the PEP as well as the APP, yeah, is not monetary financing, and it's not even shadow monetary financing right now. Um, there is no hiding of indebtedness of the member states, as the government bonds purchased are still included in the national debt. The member states have to pay interests, yeah. Um, hence, there are some incentives and market discipline left uh, supporting a long term sustainability. I do not want to talk about the ratings you need to have in order to be able to put government bonds yeah, um, um, as collateral uh, to the ECB. Um, I fully agree with Daniela on the intent. Yeah? The intent of the ECB when purchasing a government bond is not doing monetary finance, but it is about rising the price level. Yeah, um, and it is very decisive that you think about the conditions under which these um, purchases are done. Um, they are not bought on the primary market. Um, the ECB, with the limits on issues as well as issuance, yeah, uh, put a clear rule on that they do not get a major creditor of um, um, of a. Um, a member state, yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I am truly convinced that this is very important that we that the ECB does not get into a situation where they are the ones um, deciding about legal measures, yeah, when when something bad happens, yeah. So for me, um, uh, it is very very important, yeah, that um, the intent of the purchases, yeah, are still linked with the conditions yeah, um, of these purchases uh, to uh, raising uh, the price level, but not doing monetary financing. So in a nutshell, I tell you very clearly, I, I believe that only an independent central bank will be effective and efficient in fulfilling its mandate and any coordination will hamper that. Yeah? I'm convinced that the best role the central bank can fulfill uh, with regard to combating climate change is to be effective and efficient in ensuring price stability. And that it does its part with regard to financial stability for sure too. Yeah? And then all the other things which Sylvie talked about, yeah? looking for transparency, um, looking into the non-monetary po po um, uh, portfolio of the ECB, doing banking supervision, thinking about financial stability and pricing the risk for the financial stability in the collateral too. All of this needs to be done by the central bank, for sure. Many Great. thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabine. I think <laughs> we've, we've definitely got a, a discussion to have here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna let Daniela respond and then Sylvie. So we'll go in reverse order if that's okay, Sylvie. Um, first let Daniela respond and then, then, then come back to you. 
and then and then we'll we'll take it from there. That's okay. I I I would be more interested in what Sylvie has to say, unless it's up to you. Uh, but I, I can I mean I, I can respond. I think uh, I would just argue. It's great to see German central bankers do have a knack of coming up with uh, sound bites for for defending in the independence, and I really like that we lose the the we win the battle and uh, but we lose the war. Uh, I'm just wondering what the war is and whether we need to, given the urgency of the climate crisis, whether we need to rethink our parameters of what the war is. And it seems to me, Sabine, that you're still in the paradigm of the war is uh, price stability and the battle might be climate uh, crisis. If that is a thing that we can debate on the question of if there is a free lunch uh, and what is the price to pay in terms of, you said, higher inflation. I would, I would say, well, simply, if you look at the, the central bank purchases of government bonds for the last 10 years, these, these worries have not materialized. Whether we call them monetary financing or not, I, I prefer to call it monetary financing because many people do. I mean, this is, this is now a, a term that has been revived, particularly because some of your uh, uh, colleagues, uh, legal um, practitioners in Germany have brought this back uh, uh, quite powerfully in the European debates. But whether we call it monetary financing or not, the, the truth is that central banks are buying in, in massive interventions in government bond markets across the Eurozone, across the across uh, and across high income countries everywhere. And it hasn't triggered inflation yet. So maybe the, the mechanisms that we have in mind are not working as well as as uh, or or as predictably as, as we expect. And I think that you're raising some very legitimate questions, but I'm happy that this is a way of moving the debate forward because instead of debating whether central banks should uh, stay independent or whether they should be or not in government bond markets, we have to debate the terms under which independence might be consistent with a new coordination regime. And I think it's possible to have a regime of, I would call it coordination without subordination in which uh, fiscal authorities are not de facto subordinated to the central bank. Because whether we like it or not, this is where we are now. And Luis Garicano, who's a member of the European Parliament, said it very clearly in the last session. He said, the European Central Bank is the most powerful institution in the Euro area. It can make or break countries. And he gave the example of Ireland. And this is the political uh, context in which we are, not in the, in the nice economic theories we would like to live in, but the, in the political context is that the European Central Bank has a lot of political power. It has a lot of monetary muscle that it flexes in government bond markets. And I think given the urgency of the climate crisis that we need to now have a more honest conversation about how this muscle is being flexed. In, and, and that doesn't mean that the central bank that central banks are solely responsible for defining the terms of this conversation, but it also asks fiscal authorities to step up to the task. And th that is my, my, my uh, I think my closing uh, message here is that once uh, we get the coordination, the debate starting, then we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean for fiscal authorities to have the ability to design and implement uh, green transition policies? And that's a very difficult debate to have as well, I, I, and a very difficult question. I wouldn't assume that just giving more power to, the, to fiscal authorities with the support of the central bank is going to, to get us where we want to be. Great. Um, Sylvie, did you have any responses to both Daniela and Sabine? Um... Now, very briefly, three points. Now, the first one is, I'm always a little bit puzzled, Daniela, when people compare the situation in the US, in the UK, in Japan, and in the Euro area. Because as, as Sabine said, uh, we are a, a sui generis creature in which you're talking about fiscal authority. Which one? Which one? The European non-existing one? We are just beginning to have the next generation EU under exceptional circumstances. So I think we should try to be, to be very rigorous. And, and I say exactly the same within the Euro system when we do our comparisons. To be honest, I don't know uh, if it is it makes sense to compare what the British governments can do uh, working closely or not with the Bank of England or what the federal authorities in the US can do with the Fed closely or not and what we can do in Europe. And even what you say on austerity is very interesting because in a country like France, I'm not going to talk about others, what I observe 
is that after all these years of austerity, we have huge deficits, huge amounts of debt. So maybe it's not the only explanation. So I, I just would like to, and it's not an easy thing because of course, as we are a work in progress in Europe, uh, when we talk about fiscal authorities, we have different fiscal authorities. In the last year, you had countries that put their public finances in order. And when we are talking about the spread, it's between countries having different politics. So I, I have no answer on all the questions you, you pose with passion. I, I just try to stick to where we are. Uh, and as uh, Zabine said, whatever we think, in my position, I am working in the French Central Bank within the system and I have to stick to the rules. It's a matter of credibility. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of mutual respect. We decided to create the Euro together with certain conditions. If the governments want to change the rules, they are free to do it. What we try to do is to, uh, to make use of the mandate in a changing world, because of course, between the Maastricht Treaty and today there are new challenges, digitalization, finance is not the same as it was at the end of the 1980s. Or... So I would say, let's try to, to look at all this uh, with some humility and the fact that it is even more complex in Europe than elsewhere, which is not a reason not to do anything and not to ask a question. The, the last point I wanted to make is on you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the people who say fiscal policy. And they are, in a government, you have much more than just a budget. What we need for the future is to have people who are skilled. So we need money, but we need also a good education system. We need uh, vocational training, uh, lifelong vocational training. We need good investment, we need research, which requires money, but not only money. And I'm always puzzled in this debate between monetary policy, fiscal policy, the quality of public spending is no more uh, mentioned. Uh, the fact that we are in a worldwide competition, which requires that we adapt our systems and we should see the right combination of all instruments in a way that increases, that gives incentives to change, to adapt educational system, to adapt our research. We also have other questions on banking union. Zabine knows much more than I because she was dealing with supervision, but we have the rules, we have the institution, we, but we still don't have the cross-border financing, be it in the banking union, be it with uh, non-existing yet continental capital uh, unit. And all these elements contribute to the um, welfare of, of the Europeans, to the commonwealth and finance the social system. So I think it's a little bit easy just to reduce the debate between central bank and government on the amount of money. I would wish as a French taxpayer that there is a better use of public spending in my country. Okay, thanks very much, Sylvie. I, I just would like to encourage the people putting questions into the question box. Thank you very much. If you if you can pose the question in, in, in about two sentences, you'll you'll get much more of a chance of, of us being able to, to, to call on you. Um, I, I am gonna just throw out some questions from the audience, but please also feel free everyone to, to keep on re remarking on each other's remarks that, that, that were previously made and I, and I will let you uh, end out, you'll be able to, to speak. So there, there was one question specifically, um, is greening TLTROs a list of potential actions in monetary policy operations? And to add to that, by not greening or decarbonizing these operations, is the ECB reinforcing climate-related financial risks and breaching its mandate? A second question, and this was actually right at you, um, Sylvie, but I, I think the whole panel can answer. Um, it's a question about the taxonomy. Should the ECB or shouldn't the ECB be more active in the debate? And shouldn't the ECB push for a dirty taxonomy so that it can be integrated into its own operations? And then one final question, is the ECB democratically mandated to support specific sectors over other sectors? Put differently, 
is ECB mandated to support carbon and fossil fuel sectors? Um, Sabine, let's start with you and then, then we'll, we'll go backwards. Okay, let me, let me uh, first uh, try to address um, the questions uh, from the audience. Um, with regard to the green TLTRO, I mean, I would like to come back to what um, Sylvie said. Yeah, I mean, when thinking about um, deciding about green or brown, you need to have a lot of data, yeah, because you do not want to make the wrong uh, decision. You do not want to be um, a victim of greenwashing, uh, for example. Yeah, so this means you need to have a taxonomy, uh, you need to have a disclosure, yeah, um, and and right now at that point in time we are not. I think we are in the euro area nor globally um, able to exactly yeah, decide what is green and what is not green. Um, that is the first question. Second, would this mean, question back, yeah, that you do not do TLTROs with everything else? Meaning if, um, um, if a bank uh, tries to finance restaurants right now and they cannot prove yeah, that they are green restaurants, yeah, that they are uh, sustainable, yeah, as such. Um, what, what do you do? Would you say, okay, dear bank, I do not want to give you a kind of benefit for um, uh, supporting uh, restaurants, um, hotels, um, theaters, etc., because they are not green, yeah, um, uh, corporate loans, yeah. Um, I would think Directly, you come to my question, you know, in, 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 in my first uh, comment, yeah, you come directly to the question, what does this mean? Do you want um, the ECB to drop its mandate price stability, you know, um, supporting the economy in order to raise the price level as a whole, yeah, uh, by um, uh, privileging a green? Um, economy, whatever green is, because nobody knows right now, or uh, do you want to have conflicting interests doing both? Um, so these are discussions and questions, yeah, which are much more difficult than to talk about it just in five minutes. Yeah, we allow uh, this question alone, we could use a three days conference, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, Dirty taxonomy. Well, I have to tell you, I, I would love to have a taxonomy. It does not need to be perfect. I'm not a German dogmatic, I tell you, yeah? And, and don't laugh, I mean, <laughs> yeah? Uh, I'm really not, yeah? It means, for me, it means you need to have something. It needs to be disclosed. The economy needs to be able to disclose their carbon intensity, yeah? Um, uh, with the taxonomy and it doesn't need to be perfect yeah fine with dirty taxonomy as long as you do not um, say something is green and it's totally brown perhaps even black yeah that would be uh, worse um, let me come back to Daniela with one uh, sentence yeah because she said that inflation did not come back with all the monetary financing as I say there is no monetary financing yeah um, because of the different intent, because of the conditions, because of the limitations, because of all kinds of other things, it it did not come back. Yeah, uh, but as soon as you change the intent and you very clearly say to the market, we start printing money. Yeah, without any implications on um, um, uh, the indebtedness shown. Yeah, shown. I mean, it's only a fake. Yeah that it, it's not indebted, yeah? then you will see inflation coming back. I'm very sure because then in a very short term, um, there will be uh, the loss of confidence and the trust in ensuring price stability. And the, uh, Sabine, there was still the question whether the central bank is mandated to support carbon sectors. Um, the um, ECB is mandated to, to ensure price stability, and thus it means you have to uh, take um, the measures um, to ensure that um, uh, you get to a certain price level. Yeah, and you do not privilege carbon um, nor non-carbon right now. Yeah, what I would uh, prefer is to have transparency and disclosure and 
then to think about what kind um, of collateral you would take in as a central bank. But again, we are not yet there, yeah? I mean, if you do not know what is green, you cannot do it. Okay, um, Daniela, did you want to speak to some of those questions? There's the question about whether we, we want to, you can, you can think about it greening, or I think Sylvia had a, a, a very nice way of, of saying decarbonizing, which means maybe we can just get rid of the coal ones, right? Um, TLTROs. Then there was a question about the dirty taxonomy. And then I think there was a, still the continuing ongoing question about the longer central banks hold government bonds on their uh, balance sheets, does that start to look more like a fiscal operation from your perspective? Well, um, thank you. Maybe I can start with the last one. Uh, so I can, I remember Sabine's last uh, argument. Uh, I, I mean, my, the, the financial market participants that I follow on Twitter, Sabine, call, uh, describe QE as fiscal QE. So I think uh, there is not much uh, sort of um, misunderstanding of what the ECB has been doing over the last few years in, in government bond markets. Um, I would argue that uh, the way that I understand your arguments is that once the ECB declares its intentions to support governments, then we will have inflation, which I guess is one way of getting inflation because for the last 10 years, the ECB has tried very hard to get inflation and it hasn't succeeded. So maybe that's a more effective way of going about it. Having said that- Too in much inflation, huh? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but in, in, in stricter terms, I think what you're referring to is the signaling channel of monetary policy and the idea that if you somehow move away from the signaling effects that cent the central bank has, uh, we will have inflation. I don't think that the signaling channel is very powerful. I have uh, a very different view of how inflationary pressures develop and that it has to do a lot more with sort of supply side and, and pricing the uh, uh, Daniela, whatever than... it takes, whatever it takes and its impact. <laughs> Well, uh, yes, I mean, this is a, a, a longer debate that, that we can have, but I think in, 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 in broad terms, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure that, I, that there is agreement that simply uh, creating a mechanism of coordination between central banks and, and fiscal authorities that works better than what we have now. And I think whether we call it monetary financing or not, there is some mechanism through which the central banks are basically depressing yields in the Eurozone and elsewhere. And, and there is a legitimate question that Sylvie asked, I think, which has to do with, should we make comparisons? And I think the citizens of the Eurozone, with due respect, want to make this comparison with other countries because they would like their central bank to act in, in similar ways as central banks in other jurisdictions do. And if the central banks in other jurisdictions are uh, able to better coordinate, uh, then uh, it is, of course, I think, a, a legitimate demand of European city, uh, Euro area citizens for that to happen. And I say this also as a Romanian who will, will eventually uh, see um, the Euro in, 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 in our country. So I think the, the, debate, the debate is legitimate. I think the comparison is legitimate in the sense that uh, the argument that in the run up to the Maastricht Treaty and afterwards that somehow you delegate monetary authority to a supranational entity that does what it needs to do within the rules. I don't think that's a very powerful argument when it comes to the climate crisis. I don't think even it's that powerful when it comes to the rules argument, because to my mind, the ECB has pushed the boundaries of the rules very gently and very softly, but the, the, the boundaries have been moving. Otherwise, we wouldn't have large QE. We wouldn't have, have had a, um, outright monetary transactions, and we certainly wouldn't have had a, a governor of the European Central Bank saying we target spreads. This is very unconventional and very far away from where we used to be in the Eurozone in terms of the monetary thinking behind the design. So I'm, I'm not quite sure that, that the argument that we operate within the rules is, is, is enough, given that European citizens are waiting for their government, for the institutions of macroeconomic governance to deliver on the climate crisis. And this brings me to the question of, of taxonomy. I think if I understand correctly, that question about the brown, well, we, we call it the dirty taxonomy because we were convinced brown taxonomy with Frank, we discussed this, the brown taxonomy has some negative uh, connotations that has to do with the Black Lives Matter and we, we dropped it. But the, the, this dirty taxonomy question, is, I think it's quite legitimate in the sense that there are powerful lobbies in Europe that are pushing against the dirty taxonomy. And of course, this is again a political hot potato that is being passed between the central bank and, and governments endlessly. But uh, I don't, again, it is a question of uh, if Isabel 
Schnabel is, is right, and I think she's very right, that there, is a, there are market imperfections in pricing climate risks, then whether we like it or not, central banks either reproduce these market imperfections and they shouldn't, or they take a stand. And then if they have to take a stand that says, we cannot basically be subsidizing carbon issuers. And I liked how Sabina made it about hotels and, and, and little theaters in, in, in a small uh, town, Germany. I think uh, Greenpeace and New Economics Foundation are more worried about Shell or other large corporations that the ECB uh, has been supporting directly by in their corporate bond purchase program. And with Frank and several, several others, we looked at very easy ways in which you can actually eliminate from the portfolios of asset purchases uh, the bonds issued by uh, very carbon intensive companies. It's, it's not that rocket science. And I, I accept that designing a, a dirty taxonomy is rocket science, but we don't need to get to that part of the rocket science to take some very quick steps towards ensuring that the central bank does not subsidize uh, climb, uh, large polluters. Great. Thanks, Adela. Um, Sylvia, just, just to remind the questions. Well, I, I, which one? No, I remember the question. Don't worry. Uh, no, to, to Daniela, what, just one point. I'm, I must confess, but here I, I take my hat out. From a personal basis, as a citizen, I'm a little bit worried when you tell the citizens don't care about the way the European Union is organized, they want it to deliver. It's, it's, a, it's a very important question because we cannot accept that people want all the advantages of keeping the powers at the national level and believe they will have all the advantages of a federal state like say, like the United States. It's very powerful even in France. I've always spent my time to tell people we have a suboptimal uh, institutional setup. If we want to change it, then vote in favor of uh, a constitutional treaty, vote in, but I would not go, I'm sorry, I, I would not follow you uh, in this idea because then it's very dangerous. Citizens vote, they have the choice. Maybe one day we will have a really federal offer in Europe making this step, but as long as we have not taken the decision to organize ourselves differently, you are only fueling illusions. And um, the, it's not because I'm in, talking in, for a German foundation, but I really believe that it is important to, to know who is doing what. Wer macht was? Kompetenzverteilung. Who is in charge of certain policies? Is it the national level? Is it, if you don't like the way it is done, then change it. But as long as you don't change it, respect the rules. This is democracy. And we all know, and we have experienced recently in another country, how fragile democracy can be. So we should be very careful when you, we, we don't uh, stick to, to the common agreed rules. Uh, to the questions more specifically, once again, as I've said, nothing is decided yet in the Euro system on what the strategic review is going to produce. But of course, to think in terms of greening credit operations is one of the tools between others. And we have an ongoing work in the NGFS as well on monetary policy. By the way, lead uh, it's led by, by Zabine, uh, the other Zabine, uh, Maudera in the Buba, and she's doing an excellent work with uh, uh, several uh, contributions from all over the world, and, and they look at all the instruments. So I think we should not have taboos, but as Zabine Lautenschläger said, we should be careful to be sure that when we propose something, we have the right data, we know what the impact is. Uh, we try to do our work seriously. Maybe um, some people disagree, but it's not, uh, it's, it's sometimes very complex. Not, not feasible, but complex. The taxonomy is made by the legislator. I don't have the comments to do on that. Uh, and, and the legislative process in Europe is that the Commission is proposing and the Council and the Parliament vote if they want to change the taxonomy, they can change it. I, would like, I think we are a little bit negative since the beginning of this discussion. The fact that we have now a taxonomy in Europe is a very important step also for the work of the central banks, uh, of the central, because then we can rely on definitions decided by the democratically elected people that give us some criteria if we want one day to make uh, some choices. The question of Sabine and the way you put it, Sabine was very nice, but 
behind the question of the small town, the restaurants, there is the whole question of SMEs as well. Uh, if we ask companies to disclose data and information, it's very important that we don't create a gap between the large companies which have the means to develop this kind of, uh, of uh, information. And we have big insurance companies or corporates doing quite a lot of work. And I want to pay tribute because the, the private sector has to be on board, but be careful for the SMEs. Maybe in Germany, you have the Mittelstand, they are big enough, but in, in the Southern part of Europe, in many countries, you could exclude exactly the ones providing more jobs and, and very important activity on the territory. My very last point is more a philosophical question. I'm not sure that the central bank are biased. I'm sure that we have carbonized societies and economies, and this is the challenge in front of us. To a certain extent, it's not because I'm working now in a central bank, but we should not put the blame on the ones trying to do something for a matter of fact, which is that unfortunately, we have to enter into a huge transformation and we are by far not at the end of the journey. So of course, we don't have to reproduce bias, but we cannot decide without data and metrics to change it. And once again, I've said it in my, and I conclude with that in my statement, we should be fair. So the important thing is to, be, to have the right metrics and to be very transparent and to treat exactly in the same way a company based in Romania, in Germany, in France or elsewhere. This is the key element. The, the interesting element of market neutrality is that we apply the same rules in the same way for situation which may be very complex also to evaluate. Thank you. I just wanted, there was a, a specific question for you, Sylvie, which, which was, shouldn't the ECB be more active in the debate around the dirty taxonomy so that it can integrate it into its own operations? I've answered. I told you that to adopt a taxonomy is a competence of the legislature. So you can always participate in debate. We are glad to participate in debates, but I think we should not mix you can make a thousand speeches, it will not change the reality. The ones changing the rules are the legislator and it's, it's rightly so in a democracy. Sorry. But maybe maybe yeah. one word on the person saying that it was great. I pay tribute to um, Finance Vende and the high range were free girl, free ladies, free women on, on such a topic. And you, because we are not against men. I was thinking if there is a free lunch, at least we are not going to cook it, girls. <laughs> I'll cook for you. Um, well, uh, so just next round of questions very quickly. There was one directly for you, Daniela. Shouldn't you also obsess more with fiscal policy? In practice, the ECB is keeping rates very low. Isn't the primary problem that governments do not jump on the possibilities, especially now the SGP is lifted and may remain so for so long? Another one for you, Sabine. To you as a legal person, what about the secondary objective that is so clearly written in the treaty? What would you support greening of monetary policy operations, if not the huge um, price stability? And the final one, if the threat of catastrophic multiple crisis, which are endangering the long-term survival of humankind is not enough to justify the legal instrument of the ECB, then what is? Just to let you know, I've, just, I've chosen these by their length and by the votes, I, yeah. Um, shall we, should we go back to you, Sylvie, and, and then, and then rotate backwards again? Well, on the last one, once again, I really believe that things are changing. We try to make them change within our mandate and pushing very hard. And once again, we should not be so negative because I'm quite sure that the change we can provide will help to change. Of course, the challenge is a huge one, and I'm not saying that everything we do is enough, but don't believe that we are in a straight jacket in a negative way. No, we respect the rules because it is our duty, and this is respect for the democracy and the citizens. But we do the job, and once again, I can tell you yesterday when we have adopted the, uh, this decision on the, the, the non-monetary portfolio one year ago, 
it would not have been the general mood. So let's be positive, let's go step by step, accelerate if necessary. But um, I really believe that law is also part of the civilization we want to defend. We don't go back to jungle to survive. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Daniela? Uh, maybe can I, can I reiterate then the positive message? Uh, which is first to say thank you to Finance Vende for this uh, all, all women panel with, a, with an honorary male uh, sort of chairing it. The, the, usually the gender configuration is the other way around and it's great. The feminist in me is very pleased. Um, I would say, um, I, I think to, to have the second part of the positive message is to say that as a, as a student of central banks and I am very close student of central banks, I find them the most fascinating institutions. I want to say that the CV, if I may, uh, is right in the sense that the ECB has gone come a long way and it has done some pretty amazing things and unexpected things given how it started. And I, I, I remember letters written to certain governments of the periphery uh, pushing them to do structural reform. I remember uh, interest rates being raised at points when they shouldn't have been raised in the crisis. I also remember uh, Mario Draghi's speech in London, which basically to my mind, was the first time the DCB said, this is the macro financial order that we have. And I think as a, as a student of Hyman Minsky, for me, it's always very important to bear in mind that what the central bank can do and needs to do reflects to a great extent how finance, private finance changes. So sometimes you need to break the rules or you need to sort of flex the rules because what your, your usual policy toolkit doesn't give you enough room to stabilize uh, the financial system. So I think DCB has, co has come a very long way and it's very encouraging to see that it's, co it's come such a long way under Madame Lagarde with uh, the, the climate crisis uh, and with specific commitments and to hear speeches made by uh, ECB board members where they recognize that the question of market neutrality is now on the table where they recognize that climate risks are mispriced by private finance. And that means that it's something that the central bank has to, to tackle. This is very important and nobody denies that these are uh, very important steps uh, that have been taken in a very difficult polity. And here we agree uh, very much that the European Central Bank is operating in what is probably the most difficult political setup one can come up with for a central bank, where you have national fiscal authorities that are pulling the, whole, the cart in very different directions. And you have a central bank that basically has to call the car together somehow. Uh, and so far, it's been doing it quite successfully. My worry is, and I say this as, as a late convert to the question of the climate crisis, until I started reading about it closely, I didn't, I didn't realize the scale and scope of the challenge of the climate crisis. And, and this is maybe where the negative sort of connotations and the push on the question of coordination comes from. Because I worry very much that we are in, in a moment, and I think uh, Sylvie put it very well, that the, the, the longer we delay the adjustments, the, the more expensive and probably the more catastrophic it will be. So with bearing that in mind, I think that it is urgent to put the questions on the table and not sort of, we can't afford to my mind, but maybe I'm wrong, we can't afford to fall back on the lawyers have already set the rules, uh, we will lose civilization if we don't follow them. My worry is that we, lose, we will lose civilization if we do follow them. So I don't know how to, this is a very difficult trade-off. It's very difficult to resolve it in the Eurozone more than anywhere else I can think of. But uh, what to do? It's a very large polity and, and, and its citizens one way or another will have to put pressure so that mechanisms that are democratic and then do not concentrate too much political power in an institution that doesn't want it. That to me, that is where DCB is now. It has a lot of political power. It wished it had less. And maybe that would be a better scenario for us. And just to say on the question, I forgot the question of fiscal. Why am I not obsessing with the with fiscal authorities, again, I want to agree with Sylvie that I wish that we had, bet we had governments with better institutional capacity to design programs and to plan better. And I think it is a consequence of the last 40 years of monetary dominance that governments have forgotten how to do that properly. And it, it, this doesn't just go towards better education, and we can disagree on that, but it goes towards creating civil servants that do accept that it is a, a responsibility of the government to allocate credit better, particularly for the purpose of the green transition. And if I look around the, the, the debates, for example, in Italy, there is a, a, a question of how do you design 
institutional capacity in the fiscal arm that can actually deliver on the on the climate crisis in a way that citizens uh, in Italy and elsewhere would be happy with. And, and that's a, I, I don't have an answer to that. And I accept that, that that is the next step to, or maybe a step to take in parallel with the questions of coordination. I'm trying to convince, by the way, Finanz Venda to, to have a, a conference like this, this amazing conference on fiscal policy in a few months time. Um, Sabine. I would love to see that, Frank. And I hope that you do not feel in the minority uh, today. Yeah. Um, there were so many messages now that I really do not know what to answer uh, without talking too long. Perhaps just uh, being precise again, I do hope yeah, that, um, that we do now not move into, an, um, into a tendency yeah, to put on the table of um, the ECB all the things which from um, um, our point of view are not done correctly by politicians, not quickly enough, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, um, I would think that would even overburden, I mean, even the ECB would be overburdened uh, by that. Yeah. So um, for me, um, uh, the arguments of Sylvie, yeah, that we need to, um, that we need to value our democracy and respect our democracy, yeah, and the will of the lawmaker, yeah, is a very important one because otherwise you trigger a kind of anarchy where who comes first and says the best is, you know, uh, the one, um, yeah, uh, is, is the one succeeding. I mean, that we do not want to, yeah. Now coming perhaps um, um, uh, to, to the issue uh, today with regard to monetary financing, because my impression is reading uh, the um, Q and A's that some did not understand me correctly. Yeah, I know I agree that climate change is the biggest challenge and we are, that we are not only talking about prosperity, but about the survival of human beings. I fully agree. I totally agree that the ECB has a role in this. But my conviction is that if we were to um, take the ECB away from their mandate of price stability, yeah, that then we would not be able to successfully combat climate change. We would have an advantage short term for two, three, four years, but we all know that the huge cost of transition yeah, will not be financed in two, three or four years. This is a marathon. Uh, we will have financing needs for the next 30, 40, 50 years, yeah, or even beyond. Yeah? And if the currency has no value anymore, if inflation is too high, yeah, then the question of how to finance, yeah, because then monetary financing doesn't work either, yeah, will rise very quickly. So for me, the contribution of the ECB, apart from the things Sylvie listed, is to ensure price stability in order to ensure a long-term financing via public, via private, and for sure supported by the ECB with regard to um, uh, the list of things um, um, shown by Sylvie. And now I ask you, for example, why do politicians, why do governments uh, do not decide about giving um, the European Investment Bank more capital in order for them yeah, to, um, uh, to get up to the task yeah? and the leverage the EIB can have because they can put their collateral, their bonds as collateral yeah? to the ECB is uh, immense. Yeah? But there are certain things which are not decided by the ones who are having the task and the obligation to decide they need to get up to the task. Yeah? And then the ECB within their mandate yeah, can do very important, relevant things. Yeah? Um, now, um, your question um, about a secondary objective. Yeah? Um, the secondary objective very clearly says it's second to the primary one. Otherwise, it wouldn't be you know, listed after one another. Yeah? So for me, the price stability yeah, is the primary which has to be fulfilled. And then uh, for sure, 
um, has the ECB the obligation to help with uh, the secondary one, but it is not allowed according to the law. And I think it is not economically either um, um, uh, successful to just forget the primary objective or to endanger the primary objective in order for a short term, short term gain in a secondary um, objective. Um, well, that's about it. I think you, you raised one question with me, didn't you? That was that was it. Um, just before we close, we have two minutes. So what I'd like to do is if each one of you could say what you liked about the other person's presentations so that we end on a nice positive note. Um, and we'll go back again in the reverse order. Sabine, we'll start with you, then Daniela, and then Sylvie. Well, I mean, you, I do not need to say what I liked about Sylvie's um, um, presentation. Um, I think she showed very clearly that the ECB is absolutely committed yeah, to do within its mandate the utmost yeah, in order to contribute to the combat, to the battle against climate change. And um, I mean, I, I, I fully, uh, I fully sign this, yeah. And I love to discuss with Daniela, yeah, because there are, I think, many, many um, points where we do agree, yeah. And for sure, we do have the same aim, yeah. We just have different convictions, yeah. How best to serve this aim, yeah. And we need to, you know, we need to meet privately in order to really do a big, very thorough discussion, yeah. I'll cook, Daniela. Mm, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm now actually wondering about your cooking skills, Frank, since this is the second time you're offering us a, a meal and, and you're offering a meal to a French person, which is already like a, super ambitious. But I would say this, uh, first, uh, with Sabine, uh, I think we, we are actually quite much closer than I expected in terms of the, the positions that we have. Um, and I, I really liked the, your willingness to contemplate the, the, the sort of debate itself, although we fall back onto, I think, quite uh, standard positions. You worry about inflation, I don't, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But I think uh, I agree that, uh, I th and I think you're right, that we cannot move forward in, in Europe uh, with a discussion just by having the ACB do more and more and without politicians picking up uh, uh, much more uh, on their plate. And, and the, the purpose of my presentation in some ways and this idea of green coordination is not just to say that the central bank has to do more, but that the fiscal authorities have to do more. And that's a way of moving. I think if the central bank is more publicly open about where we are at the moment in terms of the financial structure, then it will force politicians to be much more clear about what is and what, what can and cannot be done within uh, uh, the political context in which we, we find each other. And I really look forward to catching up in person once we actually deal with the pandemic. And Sylvie, uh, I really like the fact that, uh, first, I think the, the contribution of the Green Swan, and we've been reading that paper and, and it's been circulated around, and, and the idea of putting the Green Swan at the center of public uh, discourse is very important because it raises a set of questions that are both interesting theoretically, conceptually, but also in terms of policy for the rest of us to think uh, in terms of the responsibilities of dealing with the climate crisis. And I also very much liked the fact that um, uh, besides the notes about uh, the, the personal notes about uh, being a, a concerned taxpayer, which I so am I, uh, I really like the fact that now the, the, the European Central Bank and uh, Eurosystem Central Banks are much more clear uh, and, and consider the possibility of expanding or, or adjusting their toolkit in order to uh, sort of consider questions of double materiality, but also in order to green their monetary policy portfolio. For me, that is, an, that is the most important step, next step for central banks, probably much easier to do than to have coordination. Thank you. No, thank you. First of all, I want to thank the, the moderator and say that we want a gender balanced world and not a women's world only, uh, which is nice. And uh, you had a nice way to, to, to moderate. Now, Daniela, you, you reminded us something important is that we are in a world where the benchmark is global. And actually the fact that we are not well organized in Europe is our business. And it is true that uh, we compete with others. So it was, it was a great contribution from this point of view. Sabine, I always like 
the fact that you remind us, you know what, I want to keep Germany in the Eurozone. So it's, it's nice to think, no, no, really, we, because many people simply ignore the fact that historically, when we created the, the, the single currency, Germany was not the country asking for the euro. So we accepted several, and I say the same in France, and I can tell you it's less popular to say it in front of the French public, uh, but I'm absolutely convinced that it's important that we keep, if we want to change the rule, we have to open the debate, and that's the reason why the Heinrich Birch Stiftung, the finance vendor, and, and many other actors are there to, to, to provoke and to help. But as long as the rules are what they are, uh, we want to keep you. But by the way, my very last remark, have you seen how fiscal and budgetary are matching in Italy? So maybe the solution is you put governors everywhere in government. Uh, Great, I, what a, I mean, what a wonderful honor and, and privilege to, to, to be part of this and, and, and hear everybody's remarks. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I haven't done a great job in moderating because we're now four minutes over and I know Michael Peters is dying for his Friday night beer. They deserve it so much. Thank you for such a great uh, panel and event. Be flexible. Thank you, Frank, for Thank you all so much. All the it was best. really Thank wonderful. You weekend. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Thank you, <laughs> for everybody that wants to, you can still join us online. We will uh, provide a possibility to mingle interactively. The link is now in the chat. Um, so, uh, yeah, for everyone that still wants to maybe have a alcoholic, non-alcoholic beverage and uh, talk to us, um, that's possible there. It will be an open room. You can just kind of... Um, jump in and find a, a circle to discuss and uh, yeah for everyone still here i just want to say a, a huge thank you to everyone um helping with this conference it's not uh, just me and uh, the other few people that you saw but there was a, a bigger team in the background and uh, heinrich Böll stiftung and Finanzwende and sort of was a big effort um for everyone that wants to follow the project you can uh, follow our uh, transformative responses newsletter and for any german speakers um, you can also follow our or join our Finanzwende newsletter and uh, yeah I think I'm looking at my colleagues. I think we have everything. So um, thank fire you Abend. again. Yeah, fire. <laughs> That's it. Weekend. And uh, yeah, if, if you if you want to, please do join us in this uh, mingle session. I think it will be fun. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.